Hey, Jeremy here, one of the pastors at The Way Church, and want to welcome you to today's sermon. Our heart for you and our prayer for you is that you're strengthened as you listen, and we always hope that in all the teaching, you would be pointed towards the person of Jesus. And this morning, Pastor Darrell will be sharing from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and I'm going to read the text that he's going to be unpacking for us in just a moment. It says this, now... After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. They told them, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go, search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I may too come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into house, house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Let's welcome Daryl. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I believe that you enabled Matthew, the tax collector, to do his research and then write this story with great precision. And I pray now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will help us understand what he wrote. But more than that, you will help us actually live into the reality of which he speaks. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm taken by how many people came out on this cold day, right, Jason? It's, it's just wonderful. So I just needed to say that. It is happening right now. It is regularly happening to me, and I wish I would pay more attention to it. It is regularly happening to you more than you realize. It is happening right now to thousands of people throughout the metro Vancouver area, even if they do not have a clue. It's happening to thousands upon thousands across Canada. It is happening to millions upon millions throughout the world. What is happening? The mysterious phenomena being opened up for us in the text we just read. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. This is one of the biblical stories often read during the Christmas season, but more often read in the season that follows Christmas. It's one of the biblical stories that was likely read by our Orthodox friends last Saturday when they celebrated Orthodox Christmas. It's the compelling story of the wise men and the star. No sooner had Jesus of Nazareth been born when strange things began to happen. Seismic things. Matthew 2, verse 3 Herod was greatly troubled by the arrival of the wise men. The Greek verb that Matthew uses translated trouble is seismosdo, from which we get the English word seismic. 
Who are these wise men? Matthew calls them magi. The Bible uses the term magi both negatively and positively. It uses it in the negative sense to refer to those who practice occult and magical arts. It's used in the positive sense of those who have the ability to interpret dreams and visions. The prophet Daniel of the Old Testament is called by this term, Daniel the Magi. I think Matthew is using this term in a positive sense. He's referring to learned men from an eastern country, either Iran or Iraq, who genuinely sought after truth and who thought they could find this truth in the study of stars. These unnamed magi, these astrologers, saw something in the eastern sky which made them stop what they were doing, turn around, and head towards Palestine in the west in order to worship. What did they see? We're not sure. Craig Chester, who is the director of the Institute of Research in Astronomy in Monterey, California, writes, it is safe to say that every astronomical event known to have occurred between 7 BC and 1 BC has at some point been proposed as the Bethlehem star. Astronomers tell us that the years surrounding the birth of Jesus, the skies were very busy with impressive phenomena. And much of that has now been reanimated for us on computer screens. Google Bethlehem Star later in the day to see what I mean. Later in the day, not just yet. <laughs> so let me give you some examples of what you'll find. Some suggest that what the Magi saw was a new comet, something like Halley's Comet. Computer models, however, have not detected any comets out of the ordinary during that period of time. Others suggest that what the Magi saw was a supernova, an exploding star. Again, however, computer models have not detected anything like that during that period of time. And, says Matthew, whatever the star was, it appeared twice, once in the east and once over Bethlehem. No one has yet witnessed a, the same supernova exploding twice. Others suggest that what the Magi saw was a phenomena involving the planet Jupiter. In ancient cosmology, Persian, Greek, Roman, Jupiter was the star that signaled it was time for a new king to rise. In April of 6 BC, Jupiter appeared in the east early in the morning. It was then later eclipsed by the moon. In August of that year, Jupiter seemed to have stopped moving. It then began to travel across the constellation of Aries, which in ancient cosmology pointed to the west and in particular to Judea. And then in December of that year, on actually the 19th of December, it started up again. In the spring of 6 BC, Jupiter appeared very close to Venus in the early morning sky, at least in the northern hemisphere. Then in the summer of 6 BC, and then in the autumn of 6 BC, Jupiter appeared very close to Saturn and did so in the constellation of the fishes. The point of the data? In the worldview of these Eastern astronomers, Jupiter was associated with the ruler of the universe, Saturn was associated with Palestine, and the constellation of the fishes associated with the last days. If Jupiter encountered Saturn in the sign of the fishes, it could only mean in the minds of the Magi that the ruler of the last days the king of the universe would appear in the West and most likely in Palestine. And some suggest that what the Magi saw was a single star supernaturally placed in the sky to win these truth seekers. 
This star arose for that one purpose. Now, given who the living God is, given that God simply spoke the stars into whirling space, and given, as the prophet Isaiah points out, God knows all the stars by name, God could have brought that special star into being simply to announce to the Magi the birth of a new king, the great king, the king of kings. The psalmist says the heavens are telling the glory of God more than we realize. So could not the heavens then be used by God to announce the birth of the true king of heaven and earth? And is that why Matthew calls this star his star? Now, whatever the star was, the Magi deduced the message. A new king has been born. And so they embark on a long journey in search of the ruler of the universe. When they finally arrive in Palestine, they go to the most logical place where such a person would be born. They go to Jerusalem, which was known as the city of the king. There they learn that the Jews were seeking a new king who was to be born in Bethlehem, five miles south from Jerusalem. The Magi embrace this biblical word, head off for Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, they find the one they were looking for. They fall down and worship. Now, what is going on in this story? Something very profound. But in order to see what Matthew sees and, he want, and what he wants us to see, we have to set aside the picture of this event created in our imaginations by Christmas carols and Christmas cards. Not that the tr tradition is all wrong. It's just that this tradition misses the profound thing Matthew wants us to see. It seems to me that most people have the following scenario in mind. They see magi, they see magi from the east being led, led by a star across the Arabian desert to Palestine. The star is in front of them in the west, step by step leading them westward. After they arrive in Jerusalem, they learn they need to go south to Bethlehem. They are then led by the star to Bethlehem. And then they're further led to the specific neighborhood and the specific house where the newborn king is living. And so the carol sings, and I won't sing it, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. But is this what Matthew intends to create in our imagination? Is Matthew's emphasis on the leading of the star, leading the wise men by the star? Yes, the wise men are led by the message they deduced from the star, but nowhere in the text does Matthew say the star led the wise men. So we need to go back and look carefully at Matthew's carefully chosen words. Listen, verse 2. It'll be on a slide behind you. The Magi say, we saw the star in the east and have come to worship him. In the east. They do not say what we tend to make them say. Namely, we saw his star in the west and have come and followed him to this place. We saw his star in the east. They were looking the other way. They were looking westward, eastward, not westward. Verse 7, Herod wants to know what time did this star appear? If the star had appeared over the west, that is over Palestine, Herod would have certainly seen it. He would have not needed to ask this question. Certainly his magi would have noticed this phenomenon. Verse 9, 
After the wise men hear from Herod and his advisors, Matthew says they went on their way to Bethlehem. And then he says, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it stood over the place where the child was. Again, we read into that, that sentence the word lead. But is that what Matthew intends us to understand? Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It seems that the wise men were surprised to see the star. The implication being they had not seen this star for a long time. The picture or storyline that Matthew intends to create in our imaginations is this. While in an eastern country, the wise men see a star in the east, a new star they hadn't seen before. They make certain deductions from this star that cause them to turn around and head in the other direction, westward, thousands of miles across the Arabian Desert. As they are traveling, they are not being led by the star. The star is in the east, behind them, so to speak. When they get to Palestine, they go to the most logical place, to Jerusalem, the city of the king. Note, Matthew does not say the star led them to Jerusalem. They are led by their deduction and by the trade route to the city of the king. In Jerusalem, they find out from the scriptures that the king whose coming they had deduced from the star in the east is to be born in Bethlehem. So they began this five-mile journey south to Bethlehem. Notice, Matthew does not say that they, that they are being led by the star to Bethlehem. It says that they are going to Bethlehem in light of the new data given them from scripture. They were not at the beginning of the five-mile journey to Bethlehem being led by the star. The star was behind them, if you will. Then, something strange, something truly seismic occurs while they're making the trip to, Jeru to, to Bethlehem. They notice, they notice the star which they had seen in the east moved. It went before them, Matthew says in verse 9, until it came to the place where Jesus was and stood over it. The star moved all of a sudden. It too was going to Bethlehem, not only to the village, not only to the very neighborhood, but to the very place where the child was and stood right over it. What is going on here? I think it is this, and it is profound. The star is not guiding the wise men. Again, Matthew never uses the word guide or lead. That idea is imported into the text by the Christmas carol. Yes, wise men are following the message of the star, but the star itself is not leading. Then what is the star doing? Are you ready? It is following. It's not leading. It's following. The star is following. Or more precisely, the star is being pulled. The star is being drawn in. Look again at verse 9. Listen very carefully. Verse 9. And having heard the king, that is Herod, they went on their way, and behold... The star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now, see that word behold? Hear that word behold? If we've grown up in the church, we've gotten so used to that, we don't even notice it anymore. And some modern versions ignore it. It's not even in the text anymore. Behold, or lo, is the imperative form of the verb to see. It is a command. Look. Look, look, and every time it's used, it's because people are surprised something's happening nobody planned. In telling the story again, Matthew is struck again by the wonder of it. Look, the star, the one they saw in the east, 
which they hadn't seen for years, moved. The star moved. That conjunction of planets, that configuration of stellar bodies, that supernatural star, whatever it was, moved. It went south. Stars don't move southward. The Magi were traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. When they started out, they were not following the star. They'd found the scriptures, the word of God. Who needs a star when you have the word? Who needs astrology when you have the Bible? At that time, they were following the message from the prophet Micah. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for from you there will come a ruler. The Magi are making their way to Bethlehem when all of a sudden, look, yikes, that's the way to translate that, look, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. It too was traveling to Bethlehem. We assume that it's guiding the Magi. Is that what Matthew says? No, the Magi no longer need stars. They're surprised that the star is showing up. And Matthew says in verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They had not expected to see the star. Why should they? It's in the east. Look, the star. Are, are you with me? Even if you don't agree, are, are you with me? <laughs> the star is not guiding anyone. The star is being pulled. The star is being drawn in. By what? By whom? By the baby. By the infant Jesus. But of course. Of course. Ought not the presence of the creator as a creature have some kind of effect on the cosmos? when he enters creation in person? If the Lord of the universe has appeared on earth, ought not the created order somehow recognize him and respond? Matthew is holding before us, right at the beginning of the story, the inherent magnetic power of Jesus Christ. As Jesus would later say, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And there he is, just an infant, a helpless infant, and he's already drawing wise men and a star to himself. Listen again to the text, to the text, not to the carol. <laughs> Verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there's that word again, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Look, wise men. Matthew's surprised. He's startled. Jesus has just been born, and already people from other nations are coming. Already the great ingathering is taking place. I wonder if he had in mind Isaiah 60. Arise and shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your dawning. They come to Jesus the light by a message they deduced in the star and then by the word of God. Listen to the text, to the text, verse 9. And having seen, heard the king, they went on their way and behold, look, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. It too was going to see the king. You see, creation understands the gospel, even if the culture does not. The Russian poet novelist Boris Pasternak of Dr. Zhivago fame seemed to have grasped what Ma Matthew is trying to tell us in his carefully chosen words. In his poem, The Christmas Star, Pasternak tells of the visit of the Magi. I learned this from my friend Earl Palmer. Let me read a few stanzas of the poem, and then I'll read the key line. Rose like a blazing stack of straw, the sight of the new star startled the universe. Its reddened glow was a sign. The three stargazers hurried to the call of its unprecedented light. Day was breaking. The dawn swept the remaining stars like cinder from the sky. 
Out of all the great gathering, married aloud, only the wise men threw the opening in the rock. He slept in an oak manger, radiant as moonlight in the hollow of a tree. Instead of sheepskin, the lips of ass and the nostrils of ox kept him warm. The Magi stood in the shadow, whispering, scarcely finding words. And then here's the key line. All at once, a hand stretched out of the dark, moved one of the Magi aside to the left of the manger. He looked up, and gazing from the doorway, like a guest, was the Christmas star. Isn't that marvelous? Gazing at the virgin from the doorway, like a guest, was the Christmas star. The star had been drawn in by the magnetic power of the incarnate creator lying in Mary's arms. Profound stuff. Look, magi from the east are coming. And look, the star which they had seen in east and left in the east also came. And Matthew says, there was joy, lots of joy. Matthew piles up expression after expression. Rejoiced would have been sufficient. But no, Matthew says, rejoiced with joy. More than that, rejoiced with great joy. More than that, rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Someone said, has said that joy is the emotion that says, I'm home. This is it. This is what I was made for. We find joy, not by looking for joy, but by finding the king. And there was worship, Matthew says, lots of worship. And going into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. I mean, what a scene. Growing men, educated men, wealthy men, scientists, scholars, on their knees before a child. But of course, what other response can you give when you found the magnetic center of life? And they're worshiping with the whole self, with their bodies, not just their minds. Not only does Jesus draw us to himself, but as my friend Dale Bruner says, he draws out of us what only the living God is supposed to draw out of us. He draws out of us worship. They worshiped him. And Matthew says, there was opening of the treasures. They opened their treasures and presented them to Jesus, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But of course, what else do you do when you meet the magnetic center of life but open up the treasure boxes? Here, Jesus, here's the treasures. Gold, most appropriate gift for royalty. Frankincense, it's the incense of worship, most appropriate gift for deity. And myrrh, embalming spice, most appropriate gift for a king who comes to suffer with his people and die for them to set them free. And Matthew says there was a change in direction. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. I, I believe that Matthew is using this word way in a theological and ethical sense. Jesus will later say in his Sermon on the Mount, the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are on it, but the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Matthew is telling us that when we find this magnetic center of life, there is great joy, there is worship, you open up the bank account, and you go home another way. You begin to live in orbit around Jesus. You begin to travel another way, the way of the kingdom, the way of the cross, the way of the new creation, the way of peace. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, look, wise men from the east come, and look, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, all pulled in by the magnetic power of Jesus Christ. In light of this story, I now better understand what happened to me in the fifth grade. We were living in Los Alamos, New Mexico, my dad was doing physics for the University of California Research Center there, working under scientists like Robert Oppenheimer. It was a Sunday morning. Our Sunday school teacher, the fifth grade Sunday school teacher, didn't show up. And so all of us fifth grade boys were sent upstairs to go to the sanctuary. And there we were, all in a roll, 
13, 14, fifth graders sitting in a row. Can you imagine that? I remember that day as though it were last Sunday. The preacher was talking about Jesus of Nazareth. I, I don't remember anything that he said about Jesus, but I do remember, and I feel welling up in me right now, the joy as he spoke. At one point, he said, you know, you can know Jesus yourself. You can meet him today. I invite you to come down to the front of the sanctuary, and I will help you meet Jesus. I was sitting in the middle of the row, fifth grade boys on either side of me. I look to the right, none of the boys are moving. I look to the left, none of the boys are moving. I want to say to them, did you just hear what we were offered? <laughs> and yet, I was being pulled. I was being drawn in, not by the preacher, but by someone greater and bigger than the preacher. I could not resist. Oh, I wanted to resist. I tried to resist, but I could not. So I got up, and I went forward. And the next thing I knew, I was kneeling. And a beam of light came through one of the stained glass windows. And I knew I was home. That is what is happening all over the world today. Those moments when seemingly out of nowhere, we experience that gentle but powerful sense that we ought to stop what we're doing, if only for a moment, get down on our knees and worship. And now we know why such moments occur. The magnetic center of life is pulling, 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 drawing us closer and closer to himself, drawing us deeper and deeper into himself. I'm discovering that much of the frustration we're experiencing in our time is due to resisting this pull. You see, Thank God we can resist it only so long. The surprising thing about this story is that Herod and the scribes were able to resist as long as they did. He's pulling us. He's drawing us. So, let go. Let go. Whenever or wherever it happens. And like the Magi and the star, come home. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, work in us greater sensitivity to those moments when you were pulling. Work in us greater sensitivity to those moments when you were pulling those around us. Oh, Lord, please pull the world's leaders to yourself. Please pull the whole world to yourself. Draw every nation to yourself that the world might finally be alive in the only kingdom that lasts forever. Thanks for taking time to listen to today's message. If you're interested in learning more about The Way Church or if you want to get connected in any way, you can go to our website, thewaychurch.ca, and we would love to hear from you. Again, our prayer was that you were strengthened through today's teaching. Trust that you were, and much love from our team to you.